Welcome to the first episode of VSTML 2021 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Armstrong, and joining me as always is the Canadian who travels everywhere carrying a pink box for any money he finds, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It seems like only yesterday we were finishing up Renaissance and, let's be honest, ignoring the fact that your own was the mole. And yet we're back again. I don't think we'll have to worry about another low bar being set with another really bad mole candidate. (laughs) Thinking about it, I think the gap between Renaissance and 2021 is actually shorter than our gap between the two Belgy seasons last year, (laughs) when we decided the dates. Yeah, it it definitely was. I mean, not for the recording schedule, but for the actual release. (laughs) Yeah, when did the anniversary season end on TV? Last week of October. It's about the 26th-ish, I think, of October. Wow. So, yeah, just over two months and we're back at it again. Yeah, it's <laughs> eight, nine weeks, gap, Something like that. <laughs> this is our fifth season of mole coverage in a year. Yeah, it's quite startling to think of that, isn't it? <laughs> or no, six, six mole season? Yeah, we did China, then Belgium, Greece, and then we did Argentina and South Africa and renaissance so yeah this is six since the start of last january yikes <laughs> and we're not slowing down yet <laughs> no because belgi belgi actually filmed during the pandemic too it did you know how i ended the south africa coverage going i've no idea whether they're going to have recorded a um a belgi season for next year but if they don't I can kind of reconcile that because these two were really good and, you know, I kind of need a break from this. And then literally the day after we recorded that, it's, yeah, Vidum's recorded in Czechia and Belgium's recorded in Germany. So you're booked up till May, guys. (laughs) And it's like, oh, my God. (laughs) At least you don't have Hunted. That is true. But, I mean, there's a very real chance Hunted could come back at the end of the year. We don't know. There is theoretically depending on what actually happens with the vaccine they could film kind of may june time and get it up for autumn if they really wanted to so let's get the pandemic stuff out of the way because it's quite evident in this first episode that it was filmed during the pandemic i I, I was keeping an eye out for like how are the tasks going to change and they don't interact with the other than the woman working at the hotel who handed them an envelope they don't have any interaction with any of the locals yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot less local interaction, and by the look of the map, I do actually have this point, thanks to Bindles, they don't seem to be going to Prague, which is interesting. But I really didn't feel like it was too pandemic-y, being honest. I, I felt like you'd feel the heavy hand of COVID a lot more than you did in this episode. Yeah, the first tasks, because that's what I was thinking too, you know, three years down the road and somebody happens to watch this season, is it quite evident this was filmed during COVID? And through the first task, yes, you would think so, because none of the ten contestants are ever in the same room as any of the other contestants. They all get an envelope inside the room, they have to find something inside the room, and then somebody pushes an envelope through the bottom of the door like a freaking restaurant delivery that people get nowadays. So I'm thinking, hmm, yep, this would look like a task being filmed during COVID. And then... It gets further and further away from that as the episode progresses. I mean, in the mountain bike challenge, they actually pass some tourists, which is something I did not think I would be saying about any season this year. Yeah, but it wasn't big groups. No, it, was it didn't seem like it. Yeah, it was two people passed by on a bike. <laughs> it could have been far more pandemic-y. I was pleasantly surprised at how little pandemic content there actually was. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't even do like the Amazing Race Thirty Two PSA before the start of the episode. And say this season was filmed, or I guess the PSA for this would be, yep, this was filmed during the pandemic. So if things are a bit off, this is why. I have to say, just on the record now, it is my least favorite thing about the entirety of the pandemic is every TV show having to have the continuity announcer beforehand in the UK at least, going this was filmed in a COVID secure manner and it's like, who is going to complain about this? Obviously when people on Taskmaster are sat 10 feet away from each other, they're done in a COVID safe way. 
it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realise that they're adhering to the rules of the pandemic when it filmed. For the love of God, get a life, people. Anyway, on to talking about Dutch television. Yes. So, we begin the episode with everyone individually separated in a room in uh, what looks like a manor house in Jaroslavice. And in the room, they have the other nine candidates' profiles, an envelope, and a candle. I thought Jaroslavice Slavice was an NHL hockey player. It does sound like the sort of thing you would see on the back of a Boston Bruins jersey. Yammer Jager, Yar Slavice. And it, it kind of continues the trend in Vidum of throwing them straight into the first challenge, not even letting them meet each other first, just throwing them straight into it and letting us kind of pick up the pieces a lot more. Yeah, we don't even, we don't we don't get player in some of the players don't get intro well the player who gets executed doesn't even get introduced until ten minutes before the episode ends. No. And to be fair, I wish he would have got introduced a lot earlier because I really, really struggled to tell him and Eric apart. I kept mixing them up in my notes repeatedly to the point where I actually had to go back and rewatch a clip of the episode to work out where I'd gone wrong. Because I did keep switching Remco and Eric up a bit. One guy wears glasses, one guy doesn't wear glasses. Yeah, I can tell the difference between them now, because one is still in the game and one isn't. But I don't know why. I, w- I just had asphasia when it came to Eric and Remco. It's really quite weird, because I'm usually pretty on it with, with cast straight away. Yeah, this cast was fairly easy to tell apart, unlike the Mexico season where, at the beginning, three of the women look very similar to each other. So the challenge is in English, through a door... Seems to be a pun because it's dear and dear. And we begin with Splinter saying the room is beautiful like a prince and princess had lived there a long time ago. There's Splinter but no Shredder. You are going to have so much fun if Splinter lasts till the finale, I'll warn you now, because spoilers for what I'm going to do, every week he's going to be nicknamed a new cartoon sidekick character. And I have already picked out the nine I'm using. <laughs> And believe me, if he gets to the finale, it's going to get more ridiculous every week. And something interesting that I did spot is that the uh, promo pictures have already been taken, and it is the same one as on the website. So you have Rocky in her like Hawaiian shirt that she doesn't even wear for the challenge and stuff. It basically seems like they took all the promo pictures, sent them away for the day, even though it looks like it was in the grounds of the manor house they were filming the first challenge in, sent them away for the day, and then brought them back to do this challenge the next day. And Splinter claims in his quote that the mole needs other people. Rocky says that she's not uh, watched a lot of V is to Mole. Renee said if she was the mole, she would be reactionary. Mariah says she's an open book. And Florentine says he would win trust as the mole. And I have to say, I know I'm digging into this a bit too deep already. Surely if the mole knew this challenge was coming, they would just lie about their tactics in the statements. Yeah, I, I would assume there'd be deception already going on there. Yeah, I feel like nine of those statements are going to be truthful. One of them is just the mole spreading shit. And this is basically the essence of this challenge is do not trust a word the mole says. Don't trust the mole. Trust nobody. It's kind of the banner phrase of this entire show. Except you can trust your own in a laser game because he'll just win the money for you. That is true. But... Like, I just, I cannot understand how seven of these people trusted the mole. And I know we're skipping ahead in this challenge already, but seven of these people trusted the mole, even though it's an obvious trick. There's a learning curve to the mole. uh, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. This was their first fooling. And inside the envelope is just the statement, find 250 euros. Not necessarily even in your room, even though they're all kind of hidden in chairs and stuff in the room. Yeah, just mug somebody on the streets. Oh, found 250 euros. I would love to see them just break the COVID rules by mugging someone in <laughs> uh, in Yaroslavice. Hey, there's nobody else around. It was just the two of us. I didn't, I didn't mug a group of people. I only mugged one person. <laughs> I just really have kind of mental images of Josh, especially because he seems to be kind of the most fanatical person and the most kind of <laughs> childlike of this, just mugging someone straight away in Jaroslavice to get 250 euros off him. What, I'm a rested man. You really can't trust anything the mole says. And we obviously have to start 
with just one question about Splinter, which is what on earth is he wearing? I said this when the profiles came out. I will say it again. What the fuck is Splinter wearing? I think he went into Clay's closet. I think it was Bindles who said that he looked like he'd um, been mugged on the way from Project Runway. (laughs) I mean, as first episode outfits go, it is by far the most ridiculous we've seen in a long while. It's wildly impractical, and I say that when someone else has a wildly impractical outfit coming fairly soon. He has to take his jacket off, and he's still wearing a ridiculously tight-fitting shirt, so he cannot move in that. It's a good thing he didn't have to reach really far up for the 250 euros. It really is. So everyone tears their rooms apart, Rocky even checks the fireplace and looks through the ashes on it, and she finds hers hidden behind a picture on the wall, Remco finds his in a cupboard door, Josh is in a hole in the wall, and Eric's is under a table. Lakshmi's is in a drawer, as is Renee's, Florentine's is on top of the sculpture, Splinter is under a rug, and he says that it's like that bit when you're getting married and you just want to see the ring. And I'm not going to lie, your intro this week was very nearly the guy who runs around looking for people to show him their ring. Charlotte's is under a chair, and Mariah's is on the chair. Easy 2,500 euros, right? I'm surprised that Splinter's wasn't in a hole in the wall, but I guess having it be hidden under the carpet also makes just as much sense. It's a real shame that they didn't just lean in with Splinter and just put random pizza boxes in there for him. (laughs) And just hide it in a half shell. (laughs) And once they've found their money, there is a knock on the door and another envelope gets pushed under it, saying, I am the mole, I want to keep money out the pot, you want to stay in the game, and we can make a deal. Slide your 250 euros to me, and I'll give you a yoker. But can you trust the mole? The answer is obviously no. But first things first, I would put money on it that that was not the mole on the other side of the doors. Would you put 250 euros on it? If I'd just found 250 euros hidden in a hole in the wall, I would put that on the fact that that was not the mole on the other side of the door. Because it is so utterly impractical for them to have the mole be on the other side of the door. And I know that I'm going to get messages about saying this, but given how large that house was, you would still be able to hear the doors echoing if everyone was in the room at the same time, you would also be able to hear people on the creaky floors, for example. So I would absolutely put money on it that it was just the intern or one of the producers on the other side of the door who let them out in the end anyway. Purely from a practical point of view, it doesn't make sense to have the mole behind the other nine doors. Especially as you're going to have to have a producer on the other side of the mole's door to be able to do it anyway. Yeah, I can see that. I can see them making that shortcut. Just have the mole be an overall entity rather than it be a case of, oh, it's physically the person we picked as the mole who's doing that. Yeah, and the other element of that is the fact that given you know full well that it would form part of a reveal if the mole was on the other side of the door, they can always just film kind of sneaky glances at the mole being behind the door. They don't actually have to tell the truth. No one's ever going to know that they lied. Yeah, it'd be a bit tough to fact check it. So Rocky says her initial reaction is to just say no, but she could get kicked out soon. She still decides not to take the mole's offer. Josh decides to take it, as does Splinter, and he says in Vidim, you can't trust anybody, and nothing is what it seems. Which is 100% true, and 100% the reason you should not trust the mole. Renee chooses not to swap. Charlotte does, as do Eric, Remco, Florentine, and Lakshmi. Those who traded get a third envelope containing a playing card of a yoker. Never trust the mole, you morons. I like when uh, Rick gathers them all up and says, Well, uh, some of you fell for this trick. Charlotte, Eric, Florentine, Joshua, Remco, Splinter, and Lakshmi all gave up money for the yoker. It would have made a perfect opportunity for them to sow a little bit of doubt in the group straight away by not acknowledging who'd actually traded the money. You can easily do private offers of an actual yoker. You don't have to do it in front of the group. I feel like it was a missed opportunity for them to do it in front of the group. It would be funny to say how many did it, and you say, oh yeah, seven out of ten of you did it. And then they say, well, that's not even worth investigating, because almost everybody is saying, yes, I did. I feel like you don't need to tell everyone who the three who didn't do the trade were. I feel like you just give them a cheeky aside and when they're in confessional and go 
just so you're aware, you don't have to put that 250 euros into the pot if you don't want to. You can trade it for an actual yoker if you really want. Because the problem is, if those three haven't played their yokers on the first test, which is obviously the right choice, but we'll get to that in a bit, if they hadn't played their yokers on the first test, they would have been targets for a black exemption straight away. We don't know whether a black exemption is going to come into play, but we know that production love putting a black exemption into play. To the point where there were two played in the first two episodes in China. It, yeah, it would be interesting with the three who didn't give up their money to just yeah, sequester them from the rest of the group and say, okay, now you guys get to go for a real yoker so they don't have as much of a target on their back. Did all three of them play their yoker on the first quiz? Yeah, all three of them played it. Yeah, just because they knew, yeah, if there's a black exemption, they're going to be a target. Or they just didn't want to be first out. Yeah, and, and also, to be fair, skipping ahead slightly, as much as I hate the idea of getting a yoker and trading money for the yokers, I've gone on record quite a few times on this podcast of saying, you don't need to go for yokers because it just kind of falsifies you staying on. The first test is a different story. First test, you take any advantage you can because it's always a crapshoot. You don't take a group exemption because that just delays the inevitable. But if you need to play yokers on the first test, then you have my blessing to play yokers on the first test because it it's a complete crapshoot unless you've Unless you've spotted something early on, you have very little chance of being confident on that first test. So throw everything at it. Yeah, you're going to get twice as much information in the second round of play. So Rick does have an offer when he meets them. For the three who didn't take the deal from the mole, they can pay 250 euros for a real yoker each. And all three do. And therefore, they get nothing for the challenge. Went from a very, very successful opening challenge down to eh, just almost like any other start to a vitam season as of late. Yeah, it's not as bad as China, which I think started with 140 euros in its first episode, but it's not far off. I did forget how low China's initial pot was until I saw that a couple of weeks ago. Or Georgia's. <laughs> yeah, jo Georgia was like minus three and a half by the first episode, I think. <laughs> and we get a we get a laser game right off the bat. We do. Uh, the episode title ends up being equal, and we only have three places highlighted on the map. Bruno, Kutnahora, and Carlo Viveri, and I'm butchering the Czech pronunciations, I am sure. Rick's introduction to the episode describes them as each other's opponents. They are only each other's opponents in the quizzes. That's not an attitude you want to foster as production before the episode's really begun. And as you said, they do have their second challenge at the Yaroslavice Monastery. And I have to say they love a monastery on this show after Renaissance, given pretty much every episode in Renaissance featured a monastery in some capacity. When in... When in Rome? Yeah, yeah, it actually works. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was Italy. And it is time for the first laser game. They can earn 1,500 euros for the pots. If they are shot, they will lose everything they've got and be out of the game. they got 30 minutes. And the challenge is called Friend or Enemy. What? If you're Rene, you just say what whenever somebody says something because you don't hear them clearly. Huh? Wait, 1520? No, no, 1052? Huh? Shoot? Code? What did you say? What's my name? My love of old female contestants is quite well documented on this show. We haven't had a fun old female contestant for a while. Probably George is the last time I, I would confidently say it. However, Renee is 100% just trying to mole here, I think. Uh, I don't have my hearing aid in, guys. Who's talking? She's not even that old. She's in her 50s. <laughs> yeah, she's younger than my parents. Exactly. Even though there was one point, right before she gets shot, where she does the world's slowest run. I was about to say that. I was going to interrupt you and talk about that. I'm going to run. You cover me. <laughs> it's just like, I've seen snails run faster than that. It's like, geez Louise, Rene, stop trying to make yourself suspicious. I thought the episode had suddenly gone to half speed, like some people like to do on when they're watching stuff on, off their PS3. But man, no, that was there is no change of speed in the episode. Rene just runs that slow. Rene is 59. She's not even the oldest person we've had in the past couple of years. I think Renee will need to have her own renaissance by the end of this season, otherwise she's going to go home early. Or if she does get to the end, she's going to go home with a very small pot, because she'll have to participate in every challenge. 
for the record, Renee is two years older than Ron. Yeah, I, rem- I Ron didn't do too well in the laser game either, but I think he had a bit more hustle and had a bit better pair of ears. Yeah, Ron, for all his sins, was pretty much playing his first game in Renaissance. He didn't really get a chance to start in Georgia. Like, Rene genuinely was just appearing to be very old, even though she isn't. So to find the money, they've got to unlock boxes around the courtyard, and there are also signs with the codes of the lettered boxes on them. And we do finally get an introduction to the aforementioned Rene. She's been an actress for 33 years, and she says she will let things just happen around her. And believe me, we know that. And of course, Josh just indulges in a child and immediately runs out and does a roll like he's in a James Bond film. <laughs> yeah, he does like five rolls, and it wasn't just like a half assed roll. He, he, they he committed. Made, yeah, they, they, he committed. <laughs> You know in Le- Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time when you're just messing around with the controls and after you play for a while, it's, you, you just want to find creative ways to get from one point to another so you roll your way across Hyrule Field? That's what it feels like with Josh doing this challenge. He just rolls all across the arena during the laser game when there wasn't really any purpose to half of his rolls. And in my experience of laser games personally i know i've discussed my hatred of laser games before and the fact that i'm six five and therefore a huge walking target the one rule that they basically would have said to him beforehand is don't damage the equipment for the love of god don't rest all your body weight on the vest because they will break the first thing he does is put all his body weight on the vest (laughs) i feel like josh is gonna be one of my favorites just because he's so transparently not mauling that it's just hilarious. Yeah, what number do I have him on my suspect list? I have him ranked at number 10. And we already had somebody executed. (laughs) I was going to say, even lower than uh, Remco, who literally went home this episode. Yep. He's very much in my bottom three. I have a top three, a middle three, and a bottom three. And he's very much in my bottom three. (laughs) I feel bad for whoever drafts him for their team this year. Well, Michelle has last draft. We'll get onto that in a bit. Michelle has last draft. Oh, so she gets Josh. Yeah, basically because you got Renaissance right, boo. You get first draft, I get second draft, and then Michelle gets last draft because she got eliminated. And also, talking of inappropriate attire with Splinter, Charlotte does seem to still be wearing a sundress, which I'm sure is entirely appropriate when you're going through a manor house in uh, Yaroslavice, not so much when you're trying to hide behind trucks in a monastery courtyard. It's probably the least appropriate fashion choice we've seen in a laser game for a while because by this point splinter had actually changed yeah she would have a tougher time rolling around like josh did that's what i mean she she kind of shot up my ranking slightly purely because she was really dressed quite inappropriately for the laser game and it was a little bit suspicious and not one to let josh beat him florentine decides to climb up a tree because of course he did and I actually tweeted this out yesterday when I watched the episode. I don't actually know who my punching bag's going to be this season, because coming into it, it was 100% going to be Splinter. I'd already had the idea for the different cartoon sidekicks joke. But Florentine really kind of shot up my list in this episode for doing stupid shit. He's our banner this week when he's doing his confessional just holding his Yoka card, because it made me laugh so much because he looked so annoyed. What? I got tricked on the mall? What is this? And I on the subject of the Yoga cards, I kind of feel like they're going to be a recurring motif this season. They're in the intro too. Yeah, in the title sequence, we do see some sort of circusy challenge with the exact same logo as is on the Vista Mall Yoga cards. So I feel like it's going to be a recurring motif and those Yoga cards may come into play at some point. They probably still won't be worth anything, but they might come into play. And we get an introduction to Mariah, who is a TV presenter, and she says she's going to show absolutely nothing new about herself and use that to see who isn't being true to themselves. And then Eric gets himself shot, and he suspects someone may have shot him, as Mole. Splinter tries to open box A, and in Renee's first mishearing incident, she gives him the code for box P. Splinter says that he is cheerful and chaotic, but can pull back and listen. And then Charlotte opens chest N... And it actually contains money. 
Florentine says that this is his game and he can do far better than anyone who's done it on TV before. He, of course, then immediately gets himself shot. And Renee yet again hears no request for box A. She keeps switching numbers and ends up looking for codes herself. With her reading glasses, it was dark, but she still manages to open a cup of chess. <laughs> and then Splinter opens box A finally. Josh gets himself 100 euros and then passes it to Mariah, who's just kind of hiding by that point. And Rocky says she's a football player and even has her own character in a popular video game that I'm assuming is FIFA. I would hope so. It'd be, I'm thinking, well, it'd be funny if it ended up being not not the obvious and it ends up being Streets of Rage or something. <laughs> It's going to either be FIFA or Pro Evolution Soccer. And I would assume FIFA because I've not heard of any PES releases in about five years. Oh, she's actually, she's legendary. She's a legendary street footballer. She is. She's the first and only female member of the Street Legends, the street football team led by former professional footballer Edgar Davids. And she's also played for the Dutch national street football team. Yeah, because they say her team is featured in FIFA 20 for the PS4. She's named specifically on the Wikipedia entry for it. Uh, Our assumption was indeed correct, which is all that matters. And she says she's someone who can surprise in an underdog position. She appears laid back, but she will still win. And then she just grins. Then Josh opens another box and Rick comes over the walkie talkies. With five minutes to go in a very Belgian twist, the last candidate who is standing will win an exemption and they are now allowed to take each other out. Yet again, they have a choice of either themselves or the group. And Josh unites them. He delivers one of the most compelling speeches in history. Isn't it really weird how um, just a couple of months ago we covered a Hunger Games parody episode on Belgian Mole South Africa, where they had a paintball game, which literally had that twist. It's like they listened to the podcast. Yeah, it's almost like they're finally doing their research. It's great. But yeah, Josh pretty much just unites them as basically the Dutch um, Maximus Decimus Meridius. Are you not entertained? Let us unite. Lakshmi says that if there were two people left, she would have done it. But seven is a little bit too much. (laughs) What's with this number of seven? Why is it always seven? Seven people take the Joker, seven people left in the laser game. Maybe seven's just the number of them all this season. Hmm. Josh decides to take a risk and gets himself shot with money in his pocket. Remco can't read the number locks and gets himself shot in the back from a corner only Rocky seemed to be in. And according to the official VSTML podcast, I'm led to believe that Rocky did not shoot Remco in the back. Renee also gets herself shot by running as slow as is physically possible. Right after she says, I'm running, cover me. And it's like, well, uh, we can only cover you for so long. <laughs> if we knew you were going to run like that, you would just have been a, you just would have been a sacrificial lamb. At the start of the challenge. You know who should have been covering somebody else? The person that can't run more than two miles per hour. She's the worst person to be the one that's not covering. And Laxmi also gets herself shot after taking out a shooter. And then she describes herself as an artist and a singer and makes her own theatre shows. She also makes pop noir, whatever the hell that is. I think that's a soda or a pop drink. Try the new pop noir. And time runs out on the challenge. Four people were left alive at the end, so no one wins an exemption. Mariah has 100 euros, Charlotte has 75, Rocky has 125, and Splinter 150, totaling 450 euros of a possible 1500 for the challenge. How much did each person have? Mariah had 100, Charlotte had 75, Rocky had 125, Splinter had 150. Okay, interesting. I didn't know who, I was still figuring out who was who, so I only got two of those entries in. I paused and rewound and made sure I got it right. (laughs) And they have a debrief afterwards. Remco is still very suspicious that someone shot him in the back. And then they wake up on day two in Mikhailov. Florentine has already lost his mole book, which has a skeleton on it. Oh, like the landmark. And they have to choose a treasure as they finally earn some money. Lakshmi is very gung-ho about doing it and Splinter also wants it. But he sits back and then brings out his ace in the hole, a money box already containing the notes that he earned. He came prepared. He's a boy scout. I just love how much of an oddball he is. I feel like characters like that either really annoy me, or I find them quite endearing, and at the moment I'm finding him quite endearing just because he's delightfully a little bit weird. Yeah, he's one of the the people that's not even a celebrity, right? He's a programmer? 
Yeah, he's 24, and basically the reason he's on the show is because he's friends with Rick. Oh, okay. So on one hand, I obviously want him to go early because that spites the host having a friend in the show. On the other hand, I feel like Splinter's going to be quite good value for whatever episodes he's in. (laughs) I like how after 21 seasons for a Dutch reality show, since there's not too many people that live in the Netherlands, that now... They've run through anybody who could be kind of a celebrity in the Netherlands to now it's people who are friends of celebrities or friends of kind of celebrities in the Netherlands gets you on the cast now. Yeah, apparently so. So Eric and Remco also throw their hats in the ring to be treasurer and Eric ends up winning quite convincingly. And He's a former radio and TV presenter and has been an entrepreneur since 2003. And he says that he's always watching. He's like Big Brother. The receptionist brings them an envelope. They will be making a molten bike trip around the hills nearby. If they go all the way, it will take 45 minutes, and they have an hour to complete the trip, and have to split into five pairs. Each pair has to cycle part of the way, relaying facts, and it's basically check whispers. At the end of the ride, there are 10 questions. They can either choose to earn 100 euros per question, or go all or nothing for 2,000 euros. You know what I hate, Michael? You know what I hate more than anything? Pies. No, peeling oranges. Fuck that. I had so many answers to that question, from pies to anyone who gets in the way of your and Davies love. No, peeling oranges, my god. That's just that's just such a bullshit thing we all have to do in life. That's why I, I haven't eaten an orange in 15 years, just because of the peeling process. It's a real shame that we didn't find out what everyone else's irrational hatreds were, because, like, Renee's is glorious already of all the things that you you hate doing above everything else peeling oranges and i have to say with this dilemma it's interesting they did this dilemma of the 100 euros per question or go all or nothing for 2000 euros it kind of forces them all into a corner if you pick the safe option which is not necessarily a bad thing it makes you think did the mall say we're not going for 2000 euros I feel like a sensible mole would have had a plan for either of them. Because in the 2000 euro situation, you just make sure you are not relaying the correct information. Just slightly change it. In the 100 euro per question situation, I feel like the mole plays as a player. And tries to win a bit of trust. Yeah, because you can't do a big sabotage per se. No, it's not the sort of game that's really easy to sabotage. Compared to the laser game, for example, where you can just literally accidentally keep shooting people. I think the, t- the part that makes it tougher to sabotage this challenge is the fact you're in a pair with somebody else. So there's somebody. So if you like, and you know, so if the other person has a decent memory, um, probably the most you could get away with is probably swapping out one answer amongst all the facts, which is I think what happened. I think the most sabotage was just, hey, I'll just screw up one fact and bring it down to nine hundred euros for the challenge. I think the biggest sabotage you can do is probably peddling past the signs that you know are relevant. It's basically the the Belgian mole, Argentina, hell hill on a bicycle challenge. Which is what made me suspect Remco and Florentine is the fact that they were the only ones to go by a sign and had to backtrack. And I'm thinking, well, maybe the mole was in that pairing and just got unlucky that the other person noticed the sign and turned around. And then, of course, one of them gets executed <laughs> ten minutes later. I'm trying to think who was the one who actually flew past the signs, whether it was Remco or Florentine, though. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I can't remember which one said, oh, we gotta, we gotta backtrack. Because the argument, I'd say, for it not being Remco or Florentine is the fact that they were in the key position of being able to keep money out of the pot, and they really didn't. Yeah, one of them could have easily screwed up a couple answers, too, at the board. I was... Especially when they only had a minute to actually answer the questions at the end. They could have easily screwed it up. Yeah, they could have just attributed it to a mad scramble, which it was, but they got so many questions right. <laughs> That's a good point, too. Maybe it's not either of them because they were in a prime position to sabotage and they didn't. And then the person who tried to sabotage was in the third third or fourth pairing. And then maybe Remco and Florentine just got lucky with some of the answers. Yeah, that's the position that you ideally want to be as mole. You want to be in the position of most control, which is the last one, where in theory you've been given 20 facts and then find five of your own. 
maybe it was too obvious of a position to be in. Maybe they wanted the mole to be in a more subtle spot in this challenge. Potentially, yeah. So if you screw up, it's going to be a bit more obvious because then everyone else can compare notes and maybe you get out in a bit too early. Yeah, the thing is, if you're if you're last, only one other person in theory knows you sabotaged. If you do it in a changeover, then potentially three other people know. And you've potentially got three people on you then. That's the dilemma here. Yeah. <laughs> I've thought about this challenge too much already. So Josh and Eric are the first pair. Josh doesn't trust himself to remember information, and they immediately disagree about the pace that they need to actually pedal. Josh is the frontman for a band. He thinks he's good when it's chaotic around him, and he can score points when there is a physical challenge. The first fact is that if Florentine and Rocky could go back to any time period, it would be the time of dinosaurs. Josh cycles past another sign. Luckily, Eric's lazy pace means that he spotted it. Second fact is that Renee hates peeling oranges. Third fact is that Remco wanted to be the mole. The fourth is that Laxmi's secret talent is that she can lick her elbow. And the fifth is that Charlotte didn't want to be the mole. I hear 80% of people who read that somebody can lick their elbow try to lick their elbow. Oh yeah, it's one of those psychological things. It's like those um, brain tests where people go, here's some facts, one, two, three, five, and then fact number five is there was no number four. Then fact number six is you went back and checked there was no number four. Charlotte and Mariah are the second duo. Josh and Eric arrive after 14 minutes. Josh tries to keep the facts simple. Eric keeps butting in. The sixth fact is that Rocky's hidden talent is impersonations. The seventh is that Lakshmi wanted to be the mole. Eighth is that Splinter would have been called Zay if he'd been a girl. The ninth is that Josh and Renee both like the smell of petrol. Renee is coming across as being a right weirdo in this challenge. And the tenth is that Eric wanted to be the mole. What's funny is that uh, Jan and I just watched the movie Anchorman. And the cologne that the Brian uh, Fantana character uses is a cologne called Sex Panther that smells like pure gasoline. So it's kind of funny that you have two people on Vidim a few days after I watched that say, we really like the smell of gasoline. And I'm thinking, hmm, they might like the Sex Panther cologne then. It's really interesting that they chose these facts to um, relate because it's either what's your favorite smell in the world and they answered petrol or... There is a question on the pre-season stuff going, do you like the smell of petrol? Which is pretty weird. <laughs> yeah, that very specific smell. Yeah, it does sound like a vague threat from production to go, do you like the smell of petrol? Do you want to smell it more? Do you like carbon monoxide? Well, then you better do what we damn say if we pick you as the mole. Charlotte is a political journalist. Her strategy is to write a lot and try and somehow remember it rather than just reading it out like Ron Burgundy. Splinter and Lakshmi are the third pair and they get their information after 21 minutes have elapsed. Mariah keeps mixing up squeezing and peeling oranges and the 11th fact is that if Florentine could do anything else as a job he would be a park ranger and the 12th is that both Charlotte and Remco were on dislimst immense and there are three facts missing from this team. Rocky and Renee are the fourth pair. The 13th fact that we see is that Florentine wanted to be the mole the 14th is that Remco wanted to meet Tom Hanks the 15th is that Charlotte hates scraping bird shit off her car every day. The 16th one is that Case Toll is the favourite mole of Eric and Mariah. Spoiler! <laughs> I can say that one purely because I know you've seen Case. Yeah. You haven't seen his season, but I know you've seen Case, so I can actually say that one. Otherwise, I would have had to warn you. Um, and there is one fact missing from this segment. And then Remco and Florentine are the final pair. We find out that Rocky also didn't want to be the mole, thanks to the handover chat. The 17th fact that we see is that Rene wanted to be the mole. After they pass the second sign, Remco spots that they're passing them. The 18th is that if Eric could be anyone for the day, he would be Napoleon, so he would have fit right in on Renaissance. The 19th is that Mariah wanted to be the mole, and then there are two facts missing from this segment. Remco describes himself as a singer, cabaret performer, and theatre maker, and he says he's very competitive at games, he forgets to be social, which could work against him, and he has to contain himself. We just get introdu introduced to Remco now. And then we get our final introduction, which is Florentine, who's an artist and an essay writer, and he wants to pay attention to who is being least moly, eliminate that person, eventually just leaving the mole themselves. And he is also, I believe, responsible for some sort of big stunt involving an inflatable rubber duck. Why wasn't that one the facts? I don't know. 
Renee gets humiliated with hating, with having a hatred of peeling oranges. Was the baby, was that like the gasoline question? Was it specifically, do you hate peeling oranges? Do you want to meet Tom Hanks? Do you want to be a park ranger? Or in tribute to our favorite contestant last year, do you want to find out who the mole is? <laughs> so I've just looked up uh, Florentine's rubber duck sculptures. It's a series of several giant floating sculptures of yellow rubber ducks designed by Florentine Hoffman which have appeared in many cities around the world, including Hong Kong, Pittsburgh, Toronto, Baku, and Sydney. Wasn't Azerbaijan? Yes. Man, Bert and Ernie must just be wetting themselves thinking about these rubber ducky statues. And they arrive with one minute to spare, and they have to fill in each name who wanted to be the mole and who didn't. And each one that is correct will earn them 100 euros. And they fill in that Charlotte, Renee, and Rocky didn't, and Eric, Florentine, Josh, Laxmi, Mariah, Remco, and Splinter did. And we know from the signs that we saw that seven of those are right and one of them is wrong. They end up getting nine rights, which means that they earn 900 euros of a possible 2,000 for the challenge and 1,350 of a possible 6,000 for the episode. Something interesting I do want to flag about this challenge, though, is that usually when they give them an all or nothing choice or the choice between earning more money but going all or nothing and less money and earning incrementally. For example here, they would have said the max prize was €2,000. They didn't on the on-screen graphic. They only said 1000 Yeah, I wasn't even aware they had a choice. Yeah, they did have a choice. And the on-screen graphic only said 1000 but usually in that situation they always say 2000 Yeah, and it was interesting to make them decide this before they began the game. Because usually how they format something like this on the mole is they get to the very end of the challenge, the host says, oh, by the way, you won 900 euros on this. You can go all or nothing with the other facts and possibly win or double it and say you either get 1800 or you get zero if you can answer these next 10 all correctly. Yeah, the um, it's very interesting because they did obviously make the right choice here by going for the 100 euros. But I feel like we didn't see as much of the mole purely because they chose that rather than going for the all or nothing one. And so something I've been thinking about since I watched the episode yesterday is the fact that I know we like to compare and contrast Belgian Dutch mole. And it really feels like, especially after covering the first two Belgian seasons of the rebooted seasons uh, last year, it feels like Belgi focuses a lot more on the group as a whole and the relationships between those people. And the Netherlands goes more gung-ho on the mole, and it being their story, and everyone else just being a bit player. And I wonder whether you agree with that. <laughs> That's actually, I'm trying to think through the past couple of Vidim seasons. I mean, well, last season we saw more alliances than usual. Saw how the people get along with each other. The last couple of years have focused much more on the mole is this kind of mythical entity and everyone else being in their game rather than the Belgian tactic of this is a really fun group of people and also there is a mole there somewhere. Essentially, Belgi is among us and going, there's one imposter among us. And Vidim is just, here is the mole, this is what they did. Oh, and there are other people around them as well. Yeah, I'm trying to think with Belgian mole, they don't have a task, say... Like, in this episode, they wouldn't have it where they say, oh, the mole slipped the envelope under the door and tricked them with the yoker. It makes them all, almost seem like the the mole is some sort of superhuman or supernatural being that can just do that, be under, just throw yoker cards underneath up all these doors. <laughs> yeah, the Dutch attitude seems to be creating this kind of mythos around the mole and making them this mythical being. And, oh, or like in the laser game, it would be just having the, the team go sub, go against like these mole allies as opposed to say Belgian mole where in the past couple of laser games it's just been it's just been more individual effort like well I guess they kinda of did that this episode too. Last person standing gets an exemption. Whereas yeah, with like Belgian Mole with the South Africa version, they had their Hunger Games thing. And then here with Vidim it was take take out all of these different guards and stuff around us who are who are aligned with the mole. Yeah, it feels like, with the exception of like that Hunger Games parody in South Africa, the Belgian one is much more collaborative, the Dutch one is much more individual. And yet they didn't go for the exemption during the laser game this episode. No, which is very interesting because 
I'm not sure whether I would have gone for an exemption and screwed up with six other people, but it's very tempting in episode one. <laughs> yeah, just go on a complete rampage. Yeah, it's really, really tempting in episode one to try and just get an advantage, apart from a black exemption, because that's not an advantage. More so than any other episode, I think. Because the later on you go, the more power exemptions have, and the less power yokers have, I say. Like, a yoke is just kind of nothing after, like, week four or five, unless you're really not confident. Whereas an exemption is everything. Everything. Okay, Horace. <laughs> <laughs> Rick also announces to, to Remco and Florentine that it's time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least goes home, except for the mole who can never go home. No one's got an exemption because nobody betrayed each other in Liza game. Laxmi says she was convinced that she'd have a sixth sense of who it was, but it's tough with nine suspects. Josh is suspicious because he's flirtatious with the girls and the guys just want to be around him. If it's Eric, he's the lazy mole. <laughs> yeah, that was the funniest observation. It was, eh, Eric can't be the mole. That would just be lazy by producers. <laughs> They'd have to be idiots to pick him as the mole. Just a few weeks before we filmed this, you guys gave us your own as the mole. Please pick someone who actually does something this season. <laughs> That's basically what she's saying. Eric thinks that Splinter could be good and won't exclude Charlotte from his list. She could just be keeping quiet because she has a big secret that she's the mole. Charlotte suspects Remco because he's being weird a lot and was strangely behaved in the laser game. Remco says that Eric is hardly looking for the mole. It's a little bit suspicious. He doesn't suspect Splinter. If it's him, it's a genius choice and he got screwed. Mariah says it's not Florentine. He always wants to be part of the group and participates. And she plays a yoker. Florentine suspects Josh as he's nice and friendly, perfect for a mole not to be suspicious. Josh suspects Rocky as she's so gentle in a team player, but it could be a good choice in the end. Rocky suspects Renee as she's acting too much like she doesn't get it. She plays her yoker as well. Renee is spreading between four people, Mariah, Remco, Josh and Florentine, and she plays her yoker. And Splinter was tunnel visioned on Josh after the first assignment, but that is a dangerous thing to do, and it sends you home. Rick meets them in the grounds of Mikhailov Castle, where one of them will leave. He announces that all three of the Yokers were played in this test. Splinter, Charlotte, and Lakshmi all get green screens before Remco gets the first red of the season. And Florentine is pretty shocked, it's fair to say. And once again, my favourite part with the first Vidim elimination, especially for someone who wasn't introduced to us until 10 minutes, the last 10 minutes of airtime, is he still gets a montage and everything is from what we saw in the past 10 minutes. I think four out of five clips that they showed in the montage were from like the past 10 minutes. And then there's only one from the, I think it was from when he was in the room by himself in the first challenge. Yeah. And then everything else is just from the, literally the last <laughs> 10 minutes we've seen of you. <laughs> Do you remember that? Oh, those were good times. <laughs> Those were good times of what happened at, say, 5.50 and now it's 6 o'clock. Man, I look fondly on what happened 10 minutes ago. That was that, Those were some great memories. I also quite like how Rick can't hide his contempt and he's just like, it's going to take you a while till you find out who it actually is, isn't it? <laughs> Such a bitchy thing to say. Yeah, you're really going to have to sit this one out, Remco. <laughs> Jesus, I'll see you in months I was thinking to man, you're really gonna have to, you're really gonna have to wait, and you can't even be a jackass back towards me. There's no repercussions because social distancing is in full effect, so we're not even gonna see each other in person again for about I don't know until this vaccine rolls out. You'll probably forgive me by then. Suck it. <laughs> <laughs> so next time, Laxmi and Josh have a secret mission. Everyone takes pictures. There's a haunted house laser game, some more mole coins, and a truck ride. Who do you suspect, Mr. Saunders? I'll let you have three, because I'm feeling nice. Florentine, Mariah, and Charlotte. Interesting. And irritatingly similar to my top three, I'll be honest, because mine are Mariah, Florentine, and Laxmi. With Charlotte in uh, in pretty much fourth, I think, when I did my list. You know what's funny? Laxmi is my next suspect after Charlotte. So we have the same top four overall with only one position swapped by the sounds of it. Yep. My top three are definitely Mariah, Florentine, and Lakshmi. Then it's Renee, Splinter, and Charlotte in some order, and then very much Josh, Rocky, and Eric. Yeah, I have Josh and Rocky as my bottom two, with Josh at the very, very, very bottom. 
So the pool's going to be really interesting because I'm going to be super irritated when uh, when Michelle submits hers because uh, I suspect that I'm not going to get my first choice. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake, Sanders. Damn you, you're getting your own right. So, talking of the pool, our pool will be revealed in next week's recap. You can join in and give us your week one first suspicions order right now with the link on our social media or in the description of this episode. I did tweet it out on Saturday evening, I think, and I'll tweet it out again before the end of the episode. Um, and it is also in the description, as is the suspect list for Bothers Bar if you want to join and inevitably beat me at that. The first suspicions list will be open until the next episode airs on Saturday the 9th of January. And I will try and remember to keep as many updates on the first suspicions list as I can, because it was really, really interesting in Renaissance of everyone kind of agreeing with me and Logan and not so much Michelle. Have you got anything else you want to say about the episode? Um, I'm glad we got that montage of Remco at the end, because that, that just made my day. One of these days I'm going to do a montage for you at the end of just the premiere of an episode. I'll just pick your, my favourite like five sentences you've said in an episode. <laughs> It has to be from the last ten. It has to be from the last ten minutes of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what was the point of the montage? There was no reason for it. We just saw it a minute ago or five minutes ago. Those aren't distant memories. It's not like, oh, do you remember when that happened? I completely forgot because I suffer from a- anterograde amnesia. Is Remco the most kind of purple person we've seen get a montage in a while? It feels like he really is. Even more so than Tina, because Tina had content all throughout the premiere of Renaissance, or in the beginning of Renaissance, I think, of the premiere. But Remco, Remco had nothing, in, he wasn't even introduced until the, he was the ninth person introduced out of ten, and he goes home first. His big moment is something that has been soundly disputed on the official podcast, which is getting shot in the back in the laser game by allegedly by Rocky, and it's been proven that it wasn't. Yeah, that's the only. I think that's the only quote he has from the first two challenges. Maybe a throwaway quote of "Oh, I can't believe I fell for the Joker." I'm not going to remember Bremco in a few months. I can tell you that. Yeah, he's he's just incredibly invisible. I think. And then he, and then at the end, Rick says, "Oh man, you said you were here to win." Apparently he was really competitive about winning this thing, like really into it, really one of those fanatical guys. But how can you be fanatical if we don't even know who you are until the last 10 minutes? So, thank you for listening to our Vista Mall 2021 recap. We will be back next week to continue the hunts for the new mall in Chechia. And I will also say, just as a little bit of housekeeping, Chechia and Czech Republic are both technically acceptable. We will be using Chechia this season. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are RTV Warriors. I can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan's on Twitter at LogSuperQuacky. I am MJ Harmstone. See you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next episode. <laughs>